we're going to cover Chapter 4 of the OpenStax textbook, Labor and Financial Markets. We're, there are three sections in this chapter. We're going to talk about demand and supply at work in labor markets, demand and supply in financial markets, and the market system as an efficient mechanism for information. So people think of demand and supply in relation to goods, but labor markets, such as the nursing profession, also affects, can be applied to this. I mean, there's how many people work as nurses, how many jobs there are for nurses, the supply and demand affecting that. It also affects financial, the amount of money available for lending and the number of customers willing to borrow at various interest rates. So let's start with the labor market first. The supply and demand for labor, the law of demand in labor markets, the higher the wage or price in the labor market, the decrease in the quantity of labor demanded by employers. So here, the firms, like we said in the last chapter, is the demand curve. The lower the salary, the increase in the quantity of labor demanded. Now the supply now is not producers or firms, it's individuals looking for work. The higher the price for labor, the higher the quantity for labor supplied. The lower the price for labor, the lower the quantity of labor supplied. So the law of supply and demand works here. There's just a little shift in whether it's firms or individuals that are doing the demanding and the supply. Equilibrium is the quantity supplied and the quantity demanded when they're equal. So the equilibrium wage, employers can find workers and workers can find jobs. So here's the labor market for nurses that we have talked about. Now the supply curve S, demand curve D. The supply curve S are the nurses looking, people wanting to be nurses and willing to work as nurses at given wages. So this is the annual salary, I'm assuming. And then here's the supply of jobs. And notice it's not even uniformly curved. It's steep here and then it's lesser here. So the demand curve D, these are the employers who want to hire nurses. They have the demand um, for the job. It intersects with the supply curve S for those who are qualified and willing to work at nurses at the equilibrium price, E. So the equilibrium price is $70,000 a year and there's about, what, 33,000 quantity of nurses willing to work at that price. So at the, above the equilibrium price, 75, the quantity supplied increased, um, the quantity supplied increased to 38, but the quantity of nurses demanded at the higher pay declines to 33. So at this above equilibrium salary, an excess occurs. So if we go here, if the number of people willing to work at this level, goes to 38 and they're going to work at $75,000 but the demand basically stays the same so you're going to have a surplus of workers you're going to have too many work nurses at below the equilibrium salary of 60 they're only paying 60 there's not many people willing to work but there's more jobs so the pressure to increase the salary of nurses to get more people to, to nurse, to go into nursing increases. I've seen in teaching over my lifetime um, cyclical happenings here. You'll find out that, oh gee whiz, we have a, you know, the wages of for teachers are below whatever the equilibrium seems to be. So you have a excess of demand or shortage of teachers. So everybody then moves into teaching and becomes teachers and at some point you're going to have, you know, the price of the wages go up, but 
the number of people that go into teaching increases at a faster rate. And then five years later, you have an excess of teachers and the wages then go down. And then you have that cycle occur again. Now, the same probably was true for nursing, but I think with the aging population, the demand for nursing, or there's always kind of a shortage of nurses. So there's, we're, we're in a different situation right here. But um, this is how economists analyze these labor markets. What's the factors that can shift the demand curve for labor? Uh, the demand for output, education and training, technology, number of companies competing, government regulations, price and availability of other inputs. Factors that can affect the supply curve. Number of workers, required education, and government policies. So just quite a discussion question. How will new technologies affect the wages of high and low skilled workers? Well, I'll use the four-step process that we talked about before. Remember, draw demand curve zero, supply curve zero, and then either the new demand or new supply curve is called one, and then analyze how the shift happens. And if both shift or you have multiple shifts, start with where your equilibrium zero was at and then where your equilibrium final was at and see what the result of all this has been. So if we look at that, trying to answer the question in this discussion, the quantity of low skilled labor, technological change and low skilled labor. Technology usually replaces low skilled labor. So if we had a demand curve and a supply curve and we were here at this equilibrium, a certain wage and a certain quantity. Technology usually replaces lower skilled laborers. I mean, that's what it's designed to do. Uh, you had people painting cars. Now you have robots painting cars in automotive factories. Those were, you know, decently paying jobs, but not the highest paying jobs. They were, hey, come here. You have a high school education or not even a high school education will teach you how to paint cars and you can get the job um, and you know here here's two days of training now you're doing it um, the technology reduces demand for labor equilibrium goes from e0 to e1 where demand curve one now intersects with the supply curve so we had a shift in supply we had a shift in demand, we had a change in supply. As a result, the quantity goes down and the wages go down. From a pure supply and demand equilibrium standpoint. That have nothing to do with unions and all of those things. That's just the job pressure. Now, new technologies can also increase, you know, the demand for high skilled labor as in IT and network administration, the maintenance of the various machines that you've now created to, you know, to replace low-skilled workers. There's always this debate. Are the number of jobs lost, compensated by the number of jobs increased? Um, and I think it's a high school debate class. You could pick either side and argue for it equally fervor, with, with equal fervor and never have a resolution on this until you actually see what happens. So in this case, here we have a supply for high school IT professionals and network administrators. That's not changing. But if we've automated and have new technologies coming in at an increasing rate, the demand for these kinds of workers shifts to the right. So the equilibrium goes from zero to one. We had demand curve zero and one. This is where we started. This is where we end. And we had supply doesn't change. So what happens if we go through equilibrium zero to one? The quantity increases and the wages increase. So if we look at price floors in the labor market, this is remember the floor is above the equilibrium point, the ceiling is below. A salary or wage, money paid for work or service. 
minimum wage, a price floor that makes it illegal for an employer to pay employees less than a certain hourly wage. Minimum wage is only meaningful as if it's above the equilibrium point. If it's below, you just let the equilibrium point take over anyway. Uh, a living wage is the amount a full-time worker would need to make to afford essential life, food, clothing, shelter. Now, there's no rule in economics that said these two things have to be the same. Uh, the equilibrium wage and the minimum, uh, a living wage, they don't have to be the same. We'd like it to be the same. Why would we want someone to work 40 hours and not be able to sustain themselves? But the fact is that it just does not always happen. So if we look at this, supply, this is the workers. <coughs> Demand, people looking for jobs. If it's $10 an hour and 1,200 people are going to work in whatever market we're looking at, at $10 an hour, we say, no one can live on $10 an hour. Let's make it 12. I don't know if anybody can live on 12, but let's do that. Well, at 12, the people that are hiring, the demand for those workers drops to 700. The number of workers willing to work at 12 increases to 1,600. And all of a sudden, you're going to have an excess supply of people looking for work at that $12 wage and you have downward pressure because you have an excess number of people looking for work at that wage. Imposing a, a wage floor at 12 feeds an excess supply of labor. At that wage, the quantity of labor supplied is 1,600 and the quantity of labor demanded is only 700. So if we then shift, and let me say a few more words about minimum wage, and we'll have a, a, a discussion on, on that this week. There's no end to this debate. I don't, I don't think it can be solved. You think with your heart, you think with your economic brain, what model are you using? The model of compassion where people, if they work 40 hours, should have... Um, be able to sustain themselves and have a living wage? Great. Who can argue with that? I can't argue with that. On the other hand, if you have this phenomenon occurring, well, you could argue for that case that it makes no sense. Uh, you hurt the people you're trying to help by having minimum wage. I don't know if that's necessarily the case or not, but that's the argument. Which one do you believe? It's almost a... Um, assumption, belief, a postulate, a tenant, uh, uh, an axiom. But we'll have the discussion anyway, because you should be able to think about it and um, have an opinion. All right, so now if we're talking about labor markets, I mean financial markets, excuse me, switching from labor to financial. The amount of money people have in a bank is the supply of financial capital. In the banking system, there's a supply of money. There's a demand to borrow for that money. So you put money into a bank. The bank pays you some amount of interest. But then the, the bank uses that money that you've deposited to lend to others and collects an interest higher than the interest they pay you. And the bank makes money you make money. Now, interest rates in banks are really low right now, but the rate at which banks lend has not changed. It's way more complicated than my simple scenario there, but let's stick with it. Financial capital is the economic resources measured in terms of money. Interest rate is the price of borrowing. That's the price, interest rate. A rate of return on an investment. And then usury laws are laws to impose an upper limit on interest rate, lenders can charge. You know, the, the whole thing of a loan shark, you can watch in a in a Hollywood movie of, uh, you know, I need to borrow $5,000, and you go to the bank, and of course they won't lend it to you because you have no collateral, or you, you know, you're in a, uh, an economic class that you, you've been redlined, or who knows what. But anyway, you can't get a bank loan, and so you go to a loan shark who's willing to give you $5,000, but, you know, let's say a month later, you have to pay him 10000 100% uh, 
return on his investment. You have nowhere else to go, you do it. And then, you know, the movie plot unfolds. Of course, you can't pay them back the double of the amount. And uh, so then they want to beat you up or break your legs or kill you or somehow get you to give the money and you're trying to do the righteous thing and therefore you have an action-adventure movie. If we look at this, demand and supply for borrowing money with credit cards. Okay, so we have S. And what was the supply again? That's the supply of financial capital, the savings, the, 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 the money the credit card company has to lend you. I don't have money, but I'm going to buy it with my credit card. Big screen TV. I'm going to spend $1,000 on it. And I don't intend to pay it back. When the bill comes, I'm going to pay minimum payments. So you're borrowing you are providing a demand for financial capital. So the supply is the amount of money available to lend out at various percentages. And D is the demand for that money. So normally, so in this market for credit card borrowing, the demand curve D for borrowing financial capital intersects the supply curve, the lending of the financial capital at this equilibrium point, 15%. And it's $600 billion available for that. At an above equilibrium interest rate, like 21%. And I think if the equilibrium is really 15, banks are normally charging 18 or 20 or something like that. But let's say this is 21%. The financial capital would be 750, but people would want to borrow less. They would want to, the quantity demanded would drop to 480. This is assuming that people know they're actually borrowing at a rate of 21%. I don't think most people know that. At a below equilibrium interest rate, like 13, so here you'd have an, a surplus of capital available to be borrowed. They're willing to provide much more money at 21%. But Below at 13%, many people would like to borrow that to buy their big screen TV, but the financial institutions are willing to offer less because it's below the equilibrium. They don't see the advantage in it for them to do that. I don't think, I think what happens here is a lot of times is people, the borrowers, don't worry about the interest rate. They just know that they have a piece of plastic in their wallet that allows them to go buy something that they don't have the cash to buy themselves and then make the minimum payments and then get screwed because the interest rates are all charged up here. This is, um, you know, when we talk about the economic model, uh, we're assuming people are rational and um, good calculators and worrying about their own self-interest. Well, in this case, the self-interest of having the big screen TV supersedes the economic knowledge that they may or may not have. So at Below Equilibrium, we talked about that. Um, another price ceiling example. The original intersection of demand and supply curves occurs at this interest rate or zero and this quantity zero. However, price ceiling is set on the interest rate below. And you, you would want to set, if you're the government, you're saying, you know, geez, 21%, 18% on credit card interest seems too high. Let's some, set something below um, the equilibrium point. I mean, it's just more fair. I'd rather have it at 10% than at, uh, if the equilibrium is 15 and banks are charging seven, and there's plenty of money at that. 17% or 18%, and there's plenty of money there, let's pick an interest rate of uh, 10 or 12% and uh, give the people a break. Remember, that's the people that are demanding to make the loan. Well, the demand increases. They're willing to do this Q sub D quantity, but the financial institutions are only willing to supply this much money. 
so you have an excess in demand or shortage, there's tremendous pressure to raise the interest rates. So there's excess demand, also called a shortage. Now, intertemporal decision making, financial decisions across time, deciding when to consume goods now or the future. What are examples of intertemporal decision making? Well, this graph shows the demand for financial capital from and a supply of financial capital into the U.S. financial markets by the foreign sector before the increase in, uncertain, in uncertainty regarding U.S. public debt. So this is kind of like a steady state before. The regional, the original equilibrium is E0, and the rate of return, the interest rate is R0, and the quantity of financial capital supplied, or quantity of financial capital is Q0. Well, what happens next? There is some, what do they call it? Before an increase in uncertainty. So there's some uncertainty in the U.S. public debt market, the amount of public debt that we have. So there's less enthusiasm by foreign investors to give money. The, the entire curve shifts. The supply of money that you were counting on for E0, the Q0, and R0 now shifts to the left. At every interest rate, at every interest rate, they're willing to supply less money. So to get the same amount of money, you have to have a higher interest rate. The equilibrium point, the demand doesn't change. So the equilibrium point shifts from E0 to E1, and you see the quantity of financial capital goes down and the interest rates go up. That simple. If there was exuberance about the US market, the opposite would happen. You would end up with a supply curve down here and the equilibrium point would go from E0 to E2, and the quantity would increase, and the interest rate would go down. So the market system has an efficient mechanism for information. Demand and supply models. The second fundamental diagram for this course, the first was the budget constraint and opportunity set model. The demand and supply curves explain existing levels of and how economic events will cause changes in prices and quantities. The horizontal axis always shows different measures of quantity, be it a good or service, be it a labor uh, for a given job, or be it, a financial, be it financial capital. Normally we talk about quantity in goods and services, the number of people, the quantity of people willing to do a job at a given price, or in the last case that we looked at, the quantity of financial capital. The vertical axis always shows the price, the price of the good or service, the wage in the marketplace, or the interest rate in the financial market. Changes in demand and supply reveal themselves through consumers and producers' behaviors. Price controls may deprive everyone in the economy of this critical information. Without this information, it becomes incredibly difficult for buyers and sellers to react to changes occurring throughout the economy. So the whole point of a market system is to let the markets find their own price, supply, and demand equilibrium and not try to game the system in a sense. So a generic demand and supply curve. It could be the quantity of goods and services, quantity of labor, or the quantity of financial capital. It could be the, the price or the wage or the rate of return on the y-axis. You have supply, you have demand, you have equilibrium. When we talk about the demand for nurses as baby boomers come of age, or as baby boomers age out, 
In 2010, the median salary for nurses was $64,690, six, let's say $65,000, and you had a certain quantity of nurses. The supply curve is the same. We're not have more people looking to do nurses, and we think that the only reason that people will move into nursing and want to study it more is if the wages go up. So the demand for nursing has increased as people, your professor's age, uh, hit, the, hit the magic numbers of above 50 and then above 60 and above. Uh, the retirement age, the manage, magic age of Medicare, which is 65 or 66, the demand so we were, we're going to require more medical care on an ongoing basis. The population has shifted from to an older has shifted to an older model and there's less young people. you know the percentage of older people and younger people in the country has, has shifted to older people. Well, and people are living longer, et cetera, et cetera. Now, there's a demand for more nurses to provide health care for all these people. Sorry, the phones, uh, while I was recording this, the phones were bothering me a little bit. So the demand, the need for nurses has increased from D0 to D1. The equilibrium has gone from E0 to E1 quantity of nurses increases and the salary increases. Now at the same time, the impact of decreasing supply of nurses between 2014 and 24. If, suppose that the demand for nurses increases, the supply shrinks due to an increasing number of nurses entering retirement or increases in tuitions of nursing school or whatever factors make people not want to go into nursing. So we had this, we went from E0 to E1. So the demand increased and the supply went up. Or the demand increased, so we had the quantity went from E0 to E1 and the wages went from here to here. But then if less people decide to go into nursing or more nurses uh, retire out than, than are being fed into the system, the supply of nurses decreases. So we go from E1 to E2. So as a whole result from E0 to E2, this is that four-step method we talked about, the quantity increases from here to here, and the wages increase from here to here. So the wages go up tremendously. We probably don't have maybe the quantity of nurses we would like to have, but we go from here. So if we want to increase the quantity of nurses and put some incentive in, it won't work because you'll have a surplus of nurses, right? You'll have a surplus of nurses at that wage. So this is kind of how we study things. Professor Kaminsky is brilliant at always, whenever he faces a question, we'll always put a supply and demand curve up and go through this four-step process. And reasoning through it, you've got to be pretty adept at it, but if you practice, you become good. And that's what we have in Chapter 4. It's shorter than Chapter 3, and that's the way this course goes. Some chapters are a little bit more meaty than others. Thank you very much for your attention.